Hello, hello, this is the Cats Library, and I will be your librarian today. In today's video, we continue our saga from the previous entries, and this time we follow Mike as he is thrust into the land of the Swamp Dragons, but this time it's the land of the Forge Dragon, Forest Dragons. So sit tight, relax, and listen to the story. The evening light flickered from between the leaves of the trees into the water of the swamp like coins falling from the heavens. Zell sniffed at a broken twig. She licked it and then rushed into the undergrowth like a leaf in the current, weaving and winding with her blue tail fins curled. When the sea folk had invaded her island home of the northern bog, the queen of the southeastern swamp had been the only one willing to take her in. She would do anything for her queen. That is far enough, fish breath. Zell hissed and looked up at the young red forest dragon before her. He was practically poking his stun blaster gun in her face. She slowly placed her forehead on the ground to surrender before she whacked the weapon out of his hand with her tail and shot him. There was a flash of white light and a ringing in the soldier's ears and nose before he collapsed unconscious on the ground before he could call for help. It was only a taser and he woke up a few minutes later. The ground chafed as he was dragged over it. He instinctually stiffened, and Zell shot him again. When he woke up the second time, his vision was pretty blurry, and his head and body ached. He tried to open his mouth to say something to the white blur before him, but was instantly met with resistance. He then tried to reach his mouth to free it, but he found that his whole body, save for his head and tail, were tightly and somewhat painfully bound. A surge of dizziness ran through him, and he realized that he was upside down. As the forest man's vision cleared, he immediately closed his eyes again and began struggling in earnest. He only managed to swing around wildly as he dangled from a tree branch and increased his dizziness. Zell was bouncing on the tip of her claws with her tail wagging, all the while holding a diamond cutter knife with the tip pointed in his direction. Oh, goody, you're awake. Now we can finally have some fun. She grabbed an antler and nicked the tip of his nose with the blade. Well, any situation can be fun as long as you make it fun, but you strike me as one of those serious people who can't appreciate a good joke, fire choker. He growled. You see, it's not nice to call people names. She let him go, and he rammed wing first into a tree. Today we're going to play yes and no. Nodding is yes, shaking back and forth is no. My first question is, are there any humans currently in your village? Without moving his head, he looked up, her up and down, or down and up, and saw that she was serious. Snorted a puff of smoke out of his nostrils and closed his eyes defiantly. Zell sighed dramatically, even though her eyes lit up like someone had given her a grenade launcher. She lightly scratched at his antler to test for velvet, and it was indeed dead. When he started to swing away, she grabbed his shoulders, gently yet firmly. Are you single? He stopped and looked at her with a look so dumbfounded it was priceless. She nodded sympathetically. You're single. She dug her claws into the rope and fabric and with her other hand hacked a prong at the young buck's antler. He writhed in horror but couldn't get away. It's nearly dating season for your kind if I'm not mistaken. She brought the blade down on the same horn and broke off another prong. He puffed up his tail and jerked it up in the silent signal for stop. He twisted his head as far away from her as it could possibly go. Oh, come on. That doesn't even hurt. Physically. You won't be able to compete in the reindeer games this year, though. She gave him a light shake. Now, before we go any further, are you sure that your village doesn't have any humans? He nodded and then shook his head, and then twitched his ear in confusion. Right, we're playing yes and no. I forget my own rules sometimes. I apologize for that. Are there any humans in your village? He nodded. Five humans? He thought for a second and then nodded, unconvinced. Oh yeah, some of them were different species because they're weird like that. Are there all five of the people from Earth at your base? He nodded much more decisively. Great, thanks. That wasn't so hard now, was it? A few hours earlier, Michael Eagle Lewis was having a bad day. 
It started when Jack wouldn't take his coffee mug and he was forced to carry it through the portal. He had asked both the literal code breakers and Saffron or Mary Angela or whatever she was going by this week whether the aliens had any laws about bringing food over the border to their countries or was poisonous to their people, but everyone was unsure. Leave it to good old Mike to sort out the potential interplanetary and international issue. Why don't they? Of course, he handled the whole thing like a champ and followed their fearless leader through the portal. He used to be in charge of this particular little group before she had come along and ruined everything. Mike closed his eyes because he didn't want the ectoplasm in his eyes, even though he'd been assured that there'd be no ill effects from leaving them open. He took a few steps for forward for Dahlia when he was on the other side. Alani? She didn't answer. He mentally swore, but didn't let himself even mumble the words aloud. His mother had been deaf and could read lips, and she would give him what for for any so-called desecration of the English language. Or the Polish language. Or the human sign language language. And if she'd known about it, she would have disapproved of him desecrating the Glassman sign language language. All the while he had been there, he let the light hit his eyelids as he slowly adjusted and opened his eyes. Come on, Alani, stop messing around. This is low even for you. He fully opened his eyes and saw a blurry mossy hill with two symmetrical shrubs on top. He blinked and it came into focus as some sort of creature with a no-nonsense expression pointing a futuristic taser gun at him. The first creature was brown and cream, a chimera-type creature with antlers, while the other didn't have its weapon drawn and was definitely either female, younger, or both, as it didn't have antlers. Mike couldn't tell for sure because they were wearing clothes despite being furry four-legged beasties, but whatever. They were adorable especially with the masks. The second one was panther black with glowing red eyes which flickered between him and the portal. Cream antlers firmly st stated something in a surprisingly high-pitched chittering language. Mike himself chose that moment to slowly raise his hands in the air to show that he was unarmed and not a threat and gave a closed lip smile. Showing teeth might be perceived as a threat. The antlered potential enemy pointed his weapon up at the company mug that Mike was still holding. Mike poked at the ground with his shoe to test how soft it was. If he dropped the cup, he didn't want it to shatter and further scare the beasties. There was a rustling behind him, and when he turned around, he saw Dahlia's hand disappearing back into the portal, and the whole plasma waterfall ran dry shortly afterward. He slowly turned back to the aliens. Mike lowered his arm as he did so and dropped the cup into the soft ground. He then examined his crystal necklace. His ex had a projection of an eye reflected in the surface. Marilyn Monroe's, if he wasn't mistaken. Okay, I could have used a heads up about this, but let's let bygones be bygones. How do I get out of this? The eye disappeared. One of the beasties circled behind him while the antlered one shifted his taser gun back and forth between Mike's mug and the necklace. Mary Angela began the excruciating process of looking through magazine clippings and books in order to for form full sentences in lieu of communicating with a body. The beastie without antlers snuck up closer and pointed her gun in his face. He took off his bag and bat and kicked it a short distance away from himself. Not a threat. Don't get your knickers in a twist about it, he muttered. The beastie made a confused gurgling sound. Yeah, Saf, I know. Take off your pack and take it away. Thanks for stating common sense. You're welcome, she wrote back with glittery gold greeting card text. She hit her stride with the words that came across faster as she found a whole page of an academic paper on what she wanted to convey. He nodded. Better, better. He dropped the crystal and clapped his hands. The, his potential enemies jumped. Mike held the eyelid of one eye open for a second and growled carefully, making sure to go deep to medium pitch. He then sang the half of the alphabet backwards before transitioning to the first half of Frère Jacques in the original French and scratching his left ear while jumping on his right leg three times. Then he waited for what the glass had told him the acceptable response to this was. Both the aliens just stared at him with their jaws wide open. Antlers cleared his throat. Do you speak English? Now it was Mike's turn to be flabbergasted. English? Um, sort of. I mean, yes, I, I'm the best at English. It doesn't seem to be very good at words. 
The one without antlers noted. Who are you calling an it? Yeah. The no antlers sta started at Mike's withering glare and changed course. Tyrigent, she pointed at antlers. I was talking about Tyrigent. Nice save, Millie, antlers whispered. Thanks, Milkbrain. Now we'll we're on duty, sis. I can speak English. My co-worker was just pranking me. Mike clarified. We believe you, Red. Thanks, bud. At that moment, the walkie-talkie strapped to the side of Mike's pack began vibrating. Millie stifled a scream and Tyrion shot it until it stopped moving and sparking. Don't worry. We're all safe now. He nodded proudly. Millie breathed a sigh of relief. That's not really... started Mike. I sort of needed... Thanks. That was very nice of you to look out for my well-being like that. You're welcome. Is there some sort of calamity that you need help with? Four others and myself were called to help with something? Oh, yes. Tyrgent looked down sadly for a moment. Our village sea ambassador, sea ambassador probably can explain our problem better than I can. Let me get that for you. Millie picked up Mike's discarded backpack and bat. I actually need to carry that bat? No, I got it. Mike successfully faked a warm smile. Okay, just let me put my mug in the bag. Um, Tyrgent? Checks out. Let him do it. Mike strapped the broken walkie-talkie to his belt and put the mug in its place. Then he slipped the bat out of its strap before Millie could process what was happening. Hey, I said that I would carry that. Mike turned the bat in his hands and the engraving flashed in the leaf-checkered light. I will carry it. Millie's red eyes turned green and Tyrigent's green eyes turned greener. You will carry it. They repeated, and then their eyes turned back to normal, and they individually shook their heads as if out of a daze. Thanks again, guys. That was really hospitable of you. You're welcome. What, what did we do that was hospitable? Terrigent asked. Don't worry about it. You're, you were going to take me to see the sea ambassador. Uh, yeah? The two beasties shared a look. They led the human visitor into the woods, and after about 20... Eight minutes and 39 seconds, they arrived at a bunch of mud-thatched huts, which were usually situated under the roots of the trees. They had rounded archways and river stone walls. There were a handful of the beasties who were wearing this weird cotton onesie sort of clothing, which was strangely shiny. They were doing chores, and when the two beasties who had found Mike walked past, they stopped everything to bow in the direction of Tyrgent and Millie, who explained that they were some of the soldiers of the village. Eventually, they made their way to the center of town, where there was a strange brick gazebo-like structure without a roof and little alcoves with dragon statues of different species in them. In the center of the circular structure, there was a brass antlered beastie statue. It was clearly hundreds of years old. A stone block had recently been added to the end of the wall and had the roughed-out carving of the head of some sort of sea monster, which in itself was slightly larger than the forest beastie statue. I'll go get the ambassador. Millie, you stay here with Mike, said Turgent, and then flew over the wall and into another part of town. What's with the fish guy? Mike asked Millie. That's not a... You're new here, so you can't be expected to understand, but that is St. Crickle. He is the current king of the sea folk, and about 20 years ago, he liberated us, the forest people, out of our life of barbarity and pride into the obedient, thoughtful culture that we are today. Why isn't the statue done then? Funding. Aha. They stood there for a while. Do you really think obedience is a virtue? Oh, did I use that word correctly? I thought it meant rules and order. Technically, but it could also me mean being too dependent. You can't ever be too dependent. Mike held his bat gently in his fingers and slowly and methodically turned it around. Yep, I agree. I used to date this girl that I would have done anything for. I actually broke into prison in, in, in another country for one for her. She was actually the one who told me to do all that ridiculous stuff when you and I just met. It's cool, though. I like to look like an idiot when there's a potential interplanetary emergency. The green f reflected in Millie's eyes, but didn't completely overtake them. Well, I'm not sure that is entirely healthy. It's about as healthy as your relationship with the sea folk seems to be. Our situations are completely different. Are you single now? Uh, I didn't mean it like that. I only meant whether you've broken up with your girlfriend. I am not even sure if you are a mammal. I am a mammal. Eve, uh, at least tell me you're one of those mammals with the pouches. 
Mike blinked with a mostly neutral yet slightly annoyed face. I am one of the mammals with the pouches. Oh, thank goodness. Mike's crystal vibrated. He picked up the necklace by the chain. Why does this always happen to you? Mary Angela wrote. Don't know, he signed back. So you are still together, Millie interjected. Heavens no! The Marimelin Monroe eye of the crystal glared. We were better friends is what, what I mean. Uh-huh. Turgent chose that moment to fly back over the wall. I hereby present you ambassador and enemy. A giant webbed claw reached on top of the wall, and then a second, and then a massive sea dragon slid over into the plaza. He was a mic and a half tall, which was about ten feet, and about thirty feet long. He could barely fit between the wall and the statue, so he leaned on the brass downstroke posed wings and smacked his tail into Turgent's face, forcing the forest man to move. The sea dragon growled at Millie and she put her head down and said something apologetic sounding. She came forward and gently put her hand on, on Mike's bat. Hey, he asked. She took the bat and then pulled the necklace off of him. He narrowed his eyes in confusion but didn't show any signs of resistance. The sea dragon snapped his fingers around and Tyrogen pulled at Mike's sleeve to pull him away while Millie took all his stuff off in the other direction. What's going on? Well, it seems as if all the other people in your party have been corrupted by the morals of the swamp people. Ambassador and enemy doesn't want to take the chance that you will leave before you can be properly transported to the sea. I'm going to need that bat back eventually. No, you're not. Tyrogen led him down through the back streets of town. A bedraggled civilian family bought a handful of loose branches, which looked oddly like pine, into a stone-lined pit, and the mother set it aflame with her breath. Mike jumped back in shock and then stepped forward, trying to get a good look inside her mouth. She gave him a very confused and mildly annoyed glance. Tyrogen put his wing between the two and ushered the prisoner along. She just... with the fire burping! What the... The breath of life and death was a gift of, from the dead gods, for the purpose of learning restraint. More recent scientific sources say that we co-evolved with the trees since the pine cones only release their seeds while on fire. But how do you not burn your insides? Because we don't. But how do you not burn your insides? Because we don't. But how? I'm going to stop you right there. Tyrogen pinned Mike's arms to his sides and lifted him into the air. The human stifled a surprised squeak. The forest man soldier carried him to the top of the tree line and onto a platform at the top of the tallest tree, which had also been pruned completely smooth. Tyrogen dropped Mike a little bit roughly before landing next to him. There were some leather straps lying around. They were presumably for tying up other prisoners' wings. Tyrogen used one of them to tie Mike's hands in front of himself before diving off the platform and soaring to the ground. Mike stared after him as he vanished from sight. Then he stared at the trees. A couple of four-winged eagle-looking things circled round, calling at each other. Mike sat down under the support pillar. The sun flickered over the nearby sea at the edge of the forest. Wind flared through the trees. Mike lay on his back and watched the clouds change. The ache of the curse of the green bat reared its ugly head, and so Mike began singing. Saffron, who had been Alejandra at the time, had suggested this as a technique and had indeed proven to work. Three soldiers that Mike had never seen before chose that moment to carry Ori, Dahlia, and Harper up to the platform. Mike cut off as soon as possible, but the damage had been done. Harper began laughing inconsolably. That was beautiful, Mike, Dahlia ventured. <sighs> I didn't hear music until I was three years old. Cut me a break. That can't be good for your developmental health, Ori noted. And yet my childhood was better than yours. This isn't a good day to be trapped up in a tree on an alien planet with you, is it? Is that what you think, Ari? Wow, you are a genius! Dahlia tapped on her guard's shoulder as he you tried to tie her hands. Um, excuse me, sir, I'm not sure if you take requests on this sort of thing, but is there another platform that we could be held at? I, I don't think our friend wants to be around people right now. Hold still for a minute. She took a step back. Could you please take us to another platform? He stopped with a look of horror on his face. Please step forward and let me tie you up. She maintained a stern expression, and they had a bit of a staring contest. 
You, you see, my cousin fell out of a tree when we were learning to fly, so I have a bit of fear of disabled people falling down. So could you please take a step away from the edge? I, I mean, no disrespect, but I I'm nowhere close to the edge. Just promise that you'll bring us to a different platform. The guard covered his eyes with his hand. I promise I will go and ask the ambassador about it. She once again was silently disapproving. Mike growled to himself. Oh, for goodness sake, just step away already. He said he'd try to get it done. And I'm not that insufferable. She sighed. You're a doormat. You know that, Michael? That's hardly topical. But you're an obstinate fool who never takes input. Get away from the edge. She rolled her eyes and came forward. The guard wrapped his arms around her in a surprisingly gentle hug while shaking slightly. She hesitantly patted him on the back. Everyone else sort of shook themselves back to reality after the show was over, and the guards flew back down to the village. Dahlia's guard either forgot or purposely didn't tie up her hands as he left. Good effort, Dahl, Ari said sympathetically as he put his head on her shoulder. Yes, this is exactly the kind of behavior that one should be praised and not at all met with an exorcism, Harper noted. They all settled down, trying to get comfortable until news of another platform or dinner came for them. They were completely quiet as their situation began to set in. Earlier that day, but not quite the beginning of it, Alani led the way through the undergrowth, with Mary Angela or Saffron or whatever she was going by this week following after. Technically, the glass men should have been leading the way as the one with the map, but she said that she wasn't capable of blazing a path or getting dirty. A dirty glass man was a dead glass man, and Mary Angela didn't want to be dead. That is what she told Alani via charades anyway. It's anyone's guess whether that was true. Alani stopped and put up her hand to signal her teammate to also stop, but Saffron ran into her and kept trying to walk forward for five seconds before realizing that she wasn't going anywhere. A few cosmic cubits away, Zell awkwardly stood on her back legs and curled her tail for balance. She sniffed the air. Her targets were downwind and behind a tree, and so she shrugged to herself before manically rushing under some tree roots and off into late, into late afternoon light. Alani lowered her arm and chopped the air to indicate that they should go forward. The glassman wasn't paying attention and stayed put. Alani rolled her eyes and grabbed her co-worker's arm to drag her forward. The two of them marched ahead for a while, keeping close enough to Zell to keep an eye on her, but not so close as to get caught. Eventually, Zell ran into a red antlered creature. Alani and the forest men made eye contact, just as he was knocked unconscious. Alani stepped forward with a protest on the tip of her tongue when Mary Angela grabbed her by the mouth and wrestled her to the ground. The half-human leader started to struggle before remembering that if the glass shattered, she would hurt more than her adversary. So instead, she grabbed Mary Angela's hand and gently pulled it off. What was that about, pray tell? Trust me, Mary Angela reflected across her surface. It didn't help that she stole the text from a murder mystery. Nonetheless, she shuddered and led the way. They followed after as the immigrant swamp woman dragged her prisoner along, strung him up, and started roughing him up. Mary Angela had Alani hide in the foliage and held her at a hug to weigh her down against playing the hero prematurely. Alani bit the back of her hand to keep herself from screaming in anger. Luckily, the forest man began to comply with whatever the swamp woman was interrogating him about. Eventually, after he told her what she wanted to know, Zell whispered something in his ear. She literally had her snout in his ear. He had been mostly struggling up until that point, but he went completely limp after that. Mary Angel knew that he made a strangled whispering noise. Zell cut him down. He barely avoided falling on his head and breaking his neck. She untied his wings and brandished her knife at him. He flinched and cowered under the tree brutes. Zell laughed, surprisingly like a human child. Then she raced off toward the village. The forest man lay down and covered his face with his hands and tail. Mary Angela finally let her leader go, and Alani raced off to the side of the innocent civilian. Are you all right, sir? He jumped and hit his head against the root. He half-heartedly snapped something at her in his own language. Mary Angela sauntered up, 
brushing dead pine needles off her dress, which she insisted on wearing for some reason. Alani turned to the tree trunk. Curse you, Ari, she growled at it, even though she knew it wasn't really his fault for pointing out the potential language barrier problem. She slowly came into his face and took off the mask that had been repurposed as a muzzle and untied his hands. While she did that, the glassman put the glass man put some strange lettering in her reflection, and the antler dragon raised his ears up in recognition. They started talking, and Alani stepped back awkwardly. Eventually, the dragon gave a determined growling phrase and nodded fiercely. He clambered to his feet, stretched out his wings, found that one of them could only open halfway, chose to ignore it, and started heading off into the woods. Mary Angela followed after him and swung her arms playfully. Alani heaved her backpack back on and limped after them. By practically jogging as fast as the forest man could go, they made their way to the village. They got there and everything seemed normal. The dragon saluted to another soldier and began to give a report. His superior looked at his pruned antler and smirked. He tried not to laugh as the younger soldier continued to explain how he was beaten up by a girl one-fourth his size. Alani gritted her teeth and began to chuckle a little bit herself. Some things were too terrible not to be funny. Mary Angela flicked her in the arm, and the team leader glared at her. At that moment, the sound of an angry human voice rang out. Alani thrust her pack against Saffron, and the weight toppled the glassman over into the soft ground. Within moments, the half-human was at the base of the tree that had Mike in it. The Ari, Dolly, and some green and brown frog-fish-looking dragon were tied to a food-covered table nearby, while several guards around them lay unconscious. Zell was brandishing a knife at Mike, who was clearly having trouble remaining calm enough to defuse the situation. He didn't have his lucky baseball bat. She climbed that tree as fast as she could run, Ari noted. You'll never make it up in time. However, just as soon as he finished speaking, Alani began jumping up the tree as high as if she had been underwater. Or in space. In fact, there were sparkles around her like stars, and if he didn't know any better, he would have thought that she encased herself in an aether bubble to limit her gravitational pull, but that was impossible. As Alani reached the platform, Zell grew frustrated by Mike's obstinance and punched him in the face. He kicked the knife out of her hand and tried to grapple her down. Luckily, a guard had untied his hands a bit earlier so that he could eat his dinner. Alani snuck up behind them and grabbed Zell's knife. Just as she did, the bog woman tossed her teammate off the platform. She rushed forward, kicking Zell in the face while calling Mike's name. I'm good, ma'am. I held onto the sport beam. He was indeed holding on unarmed. Alani jumped over Zell's tail just in time. Zell used the distraction to bat the knife out of Alani's hand, but her adversary wasn't quick enough to kick the airborne weapon down into the trunk of the nearest tree. The half-human stretched her neck to the side until it made a satisfying crack for the gas passed between the vertebrae, releasing and gave a rebellious half-smile. Zell smiled fiercely herself. Ah, your luminance. I didn't expect to see one, to be one such as you in the rough. The bog woman gave a mocking head bob. Alani was surprised that someone was addressing her in the highest Stellian language, but held her composure. If you were a creature of a more cultured countenance, you would be informed that I revoked that title, and then it would not confuse you so. However, you do not give the impression that you were unfamiliar with that state, so I can forgive your temporary lapse in judgment. Zell laughed politely and began pacing slowly and predatorily on the edge of the platform, low to the floorboards like a cat about to pounce. Ignorance was not the basis for my claim, but instead it was knowledge. Something that you currently don't have, poor thing. Someone ought to educate you. Zell leapt at her and Alani dodged out of the way. Zell landed gracefully and continued circling and talking as if nothing had happened. Although, it can be hardly expected that one as dead inside as yourself should have the neurological capacity to process such matters. Alani set her teeth. Shut up, she snapped in Polish and kicked the bog woman to the side. in the side. With the impact, she connected Zell to the aether and caused her enemy to levitate. Zell relaxed as if she was in water and rolled over on her back until she was eye-level with Alani. His majesty truly misses your presence. Wait, really? For the first time in the fight, Zell stopped smiling and narrowed her eyes. No, he's a bloodthirsty sociopath who has more love for his ingrown toenails than for any other person who doesn't surrender to his every whim. Go get some therapy so I can hurt your feelings properly. Alani quickly forced herself back into hero mode. He's here? 
she asked, forcing her voice to go a bit deeper and more serious than it naturally wanted to go. Yeah, dummy, we're the nearest planet to the ruined city where you enacted the ritual. So where else did you think he was going to go? Alani stood in silence, staring past Zell's orange eyes for a moment. The quadruped's third eyelid blinked, and the half-human shook herself out of her thoughts. My accompaniment will not return to the Swamp Kingdom until the young Harper kid is reunited with his father, but they will not approve of the Sea Folk's political structure. I need to deal with him alone. You will return to your queen and dictate this, and leave me and my people in peace. Zell nodded hesitantly. Oh, and also leave the forest people alone. Zell gritted her sharp teeth. I desire greatly that you would choose a consistent form of speech. Do you promise? Yes. Alani and herself nodded, but in an, app- in an approving way, and then flicked Zell over the trees to nearly the edge of the forest, where the anti-gravity hopefully put her down gently if Alani used the aether correctly. The sunset turned the semi-distant water of the sea red. Mike readjusted his position on the support beam and let out a raspy sigh. Alani came over to the edge and helped him up. He brushed himself off, even though he didn't have any particles on his clothes. Hey, Alani, what were you two talking about? Nothing, we weren't talking. He narrowed his eyes at her. Yes, you were. As your commanding officer, I order you to agree that I wasn't talking. Yeah, sure. You two weren't talking about anything. 